Hi everyone, I'm Beverly Fishman, head of painting at Cranbrook for a gazillion years. Um, I am so thrilled to see this turnout uh, in the snowy weather, but Jane Hammond is very well known and her work is loved, absolutely loved by this community. So I am very pleased to see how many people have come out in the snow. I have personally known Jane's work since uh, she had a solo exhibition at Exit Art. Well, I actually knew the work from before, but it was a, it was a uh, professional exhibition that I think truly launched her career. And since 1989, we, she showed before that, I think it's been full steam ahead. So I went to print out her resume because I thought, oh, I'll just comb the resume to pick out a few things. And it is the tiniest print, even with my glasses, I can't see it. And it's over 14 pages long. So I want to, that speaks to Jane being not only a prolific artist, but how much the world has um, loved her work back. I'm going to list a few of her public collections out of a little under 60, I believe, although I lost count the Aldridge Museum of Contemporary Art, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Brooklyn Museum of Art, the Corcoran Gallery of Art in DC, the Detroit Institute of Arts has an incredible one. If you haven't seen it, you must go down and look at it. I could do your PR for you. Um, the Fogg Art Museum at Harvard, the Library of Congress, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Milwaukee Art Museum, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, the National Gallery of Art in DC, the National Museum of Women in the Arts in DC, the Walker Art Center, and the Whitney Museum of Art. This is just to name a small amount of the incredible collections that Jane Hammond's work is in. She has an exhibition at Wasserman Projects. I urge you to go see it in person, as we all understand. We don't really understand art until we've seen it in person and experienced it. And this work in particular, especially the Dazzle paintings, need to be understood in the presence of them. So I urge you to go see that. She shows at Gallery Lalong. She shows here with Wasserman Projects. I started to look at where her work has been reviewed. It's been reviewed in Art Forum, The New York Times, Art in America, Arts, Art on Paper. It goes on and on and on. And I know from hearing Jane speak before that I am absolutely delighted as you will be to hear her speak. Let's welcome Jane Hammond. That will go down as one of the more generous introductions I've ever received. So I was saying to someone earlier, I'm sufficiently old now, and I've been working sufficiently long now that I can't tell you the story of all my work, or I'll have you here all night. So I'm going to give you kind of a recap of some older bodies of work, and then kind of jump right into the new work with an emphasis on what's up here in town right now. Um, if I were to, I, so I probed my mind for, well, what are the connections between the new work and the old work? For, for one thing, a lot of people are really surprised I'm doing photography now. And I guess one of the connections is I've always worked from found information. I'm a natural collector and hoarder by nature. I can't read the New York Times without ripping articles out and sticking post-its on them. And I'm a natural combiner. I like to put A together with B and make up a new C thing from it. So for example, I might have an image of an igloo, and I might have an image of a model of an igloo, as if it were a toy igloo. I might turn it into a wind-up toy. I might use it in a painting that's set in the Arctic. 
I might use it in a painting that's all about whiteness and combine it with bones and an egret. I might use it in a painting that's about architecture. I might turn it into a candle. I might put a cherry on top of it and make it into an igloo-shaped ice cream dessert. I might emphasize its multipartite blocks and do something atomic with it. This is what I'm interested in. And it was occurring to me today that this play with what I call the elasticity of meaning, taking something and seeing how many different ways it can mean and be. It has analogies in the nature versus nurture argument. It's kind of like what is essential to something and then what is what comes along the way and how can you take something that means something and drag it towards meaning something else? What is it? If you think about this argument, it's almost the perfect polar opposite of minimalism, where there's a supposition that things have an essential nature and experience can be pure. For me, experience is always relational and meaning is always conditional. And I see myself as a kind of prospector that like picks this igloo up and says, huh, what can I find inside of this? And where can I sit this down? And what can it be with? And what can it mean next? This is a painting. It's called Soapstone Factory Number no. 4. It's from an eight-year, 64 painting collaboration that I did with the poet John Ashbery. It was my idea. I proposed it to him. I commissioned him to make a set of titles, and he made 44 titles. They weren't fragments from his po poetry. They were things he made for me. And then I made the paintings for his titles. Some of the titles I liked so much, like this one, I made five paintings. That's why there's 44 titles and 64 paintings. So this was the fourth soapstone painting. And the thing that was interesting for me about it was to explore the idea of everything being a sculpture of itself or even beyond that. So you have like a sculpture of Einstein and a sculpture of Warhol, and you have a sculpture of the Buddha over here, but actually it's a sculpture of the Buddha as a pincushion. And then on the floor everywhere, you have the detritus of the process of making the sculpture. So here you have this kind of motion-oriented sculpture with a metronome and a weather vane, and then this is the stuff out of which this is made. So. Although I was initially fixated on the idea of soapstone, which is a soft carving stone, it took me into the arena of the relationship between sculpture and painting. I'm making a painting of a sculpture studio. And the idea of exploring things in process, the messy studio, maybe some things unfinished, that sort of thing. Um, some of the paintings I made in this collaboration have deep space and some of them have flat space. And one of the things I like to do with my way of working, which initially involved a big lexicon of found images and a few colors and a kind of stricture about using these images, almost like recombinant DNA, it was restricted in some ways, but then beyond that restriction, I gave myself the freedom to make stylistically any kind of painting that I wanted. So they had flat space and deep space and color and black and white, but also in terms of content, sometimes they were about me, sometimes they were not about me at all. This is the second of two paintings I made that referenced a very specific game that's born in the Middle Ages, and it's called The Game of the Goose. And I've now made my second game board print, the first one in 1999, the second one in 2013. So I've kind of reserved for myself the freedom to keep my interests alive, but not to do 16 things on game boards and then move out of the game boards. Because I don't think this is how your mind works. I think your mind works like you're kind of interested in something, and then you loop back to it, and then you revisit the conversation, and then 13 years later, you think, hey, I've got another idea on this. So the, the history of this game board is that it has a central character. In my case, I made this woman be Mad Elga. In the history of the game, the central character is a goose. 
And that character reoccurs nine times. And if you look around this board, you'll see her in nine different places. There's always 63 windows in the board. Like all game boards, the upper corners are upside down because the board is really conceptually meant to have this orientation. And then there's rules to it. And I discovered one of these game boards in a junk shop in Paris, which is how the whole thing got started. But I really liked it because I'm a more is more person and it gave me an opportunity to make 63 little paintings. It's really, if you count the corners in the center, it's more like 69 little paintings. And to also play with the relationship between my lexicon and a set of rules that someone else picked out. So in every game, in this every goose game that exists, there's a death's head and there's always a labyrinth and there's always a jail, et cetera. So it was like a mashup between two different sets of rules, my painting rules and this medieval game board set of rules. One of the titles John Ashbery gave me was one of my least favorite titles because it wasn't particularly evocative to me initially and it was called Irregular Plural. So I left it for a long time because I didn't like it. And then I discovered in, in making another painting, I discovered the idea of a painting shaped as a book. So then I thought of the idea of a book as two separate realities, the pages, that have a relationship to each other, which led me into doing a couple of paintings that were like purely text on one side and picture on the other. But what I did here was I gave you a miscellany of objects with no particular relationship to each other, all of which have counterparts on the other page. Someone said to me once, oh, I get it. It's like not identical twins, but fraternal twins, right? And I said, yeah, irregular plural. So you have a Roman dollhouse and a 50s dollhouse, and you have a bear mask and another kind of mask, and you have two sailors' carvings. I can't see the other one right now. Uh, and two veterinarian sutures and two TVs, etc. I actually really fell in love with this painting because it gets you at the heart of when is a rabbit a rabbit, when is it a rabbit ashtray, when, it's, when is its rabbitness not distinguishable. You know, your mind, the idea of making pairs and finding likeness is something that I think is like very natural to the human mind. So in the end, these are the names of magic tricks if you're wondering about the text. In the end, I made five of these paintings. Although I always set myself the task of making them all differently. So this one has a whole kind of monoprint beginning with lace where I dumped, I dunked lace in buckets of, of very wet paint and laid it all over the whole painting and then went over it with a mop. And I didn't do that in any of the other paintings. Now this collaboration with John Ashbery, collaborating with someone is very much like working with found information. You're reacting off of something that's not purely from inside yourself. And I jokingly said to a friend the other day, you know action painting, you know how Pollock was called an action painter? I'm a reaction painter. You know, it's like show me something and it'll make me think of something else and I'm interested in that kind of triggered multipartite reaction. Now mind you, I've never been a paint, I've never been particularly a capital P painter. I've never been an artist who felt invested in any particular media. I studied ceramics. I have an MFA in sculpture. I kind of stumbled into painting and made painting for a long time. A lot of people think I'm a painter. I never thought to myself, wow, I feel really threatened by photography or gosh, I should start making photography. I just don't have conversations with myself that use these umbrella concepts. I never thought about photography that much one way or the other, but the irregular plural paintings led me to make some paper scrapbooks because I thought the scrapbooky nature, the miscellaneous nature of this collection of details would be even better if I could have a miscellany of media. So I set for myself this idea of like, how can I have a broad heterogeneity of images in a pretty broad, 
you know, in a pretty wide breadth of media. So I could use rubber stamps, and I could use origami, and I could use woodcuts, and I could use digital prints, etc. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to search for some things on the internet that would be photographic equivalents of things in my lexicon. Now you have to understand, this is like 2000, 2002 or something. Now I'm a person that's used found information for 30 years. And it used to be that when you went to the flea market, which is something I still do, you basically had the same experience uh, Picasso had when he went to the flea market. There was all kinds of stuff collected. You had no idea what you were gonna see before you got there. You got there and something triggered your imagination or it didn't. Now we still have that, but we also have this other kind of searching, which is a very targeted searching, which is like you type ventriloquist into eBay and you get all ventriloquist photographs. Now, a few of them are birthday cakes in the shape of ventriloquists, a few of them are ventriloquist costumes, some of them are a couple of, you know, there's a couple of just pure mistakes, but you basically can go to the universe and ask for what you're looking for. So I did these scrapbooks, these paper scrapbooks, they have a lot of different kinds of things in them, like they have language play, like this is Virginia Woolf and Jack Ruby, and they have constellations that I've made up, and they have origami animals and bugs, and they have the thinker, but it's not the thinker, it's matchbook of the thinker. And, they, and one of the things I had was a Mexican valentine, which I found in a flea market. And I eventually married this couple in my mind with that couple, kind of hearkening back to the irregular plural paintings. Now, how did I get this couple? I got this couple because I typed in to eBay bears. I typed in 22 things one night. This was the beginning of this photo process for me. And this woman in New Zealand has this photograph taken in Germany in the 30s, I think, of a man in a polar bear costume with a woman in an old-fashioned bathing suit at the beach. So I bought it. And then I bought some other bear photos. And then I bought some other bear photos. And about uh, six weeks into it, I had 900 photos that I had bought on eBay. <laughs> The crazy thing was I had a painting show kind of bearing down on me and I'm buying photos, 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 and I have them spread all over the studio on various tables. Now, most of you probably know this card game concentration where you have the cards and different, you kind of the, the what and the where are kind of mixed together in your mind and you remember things by where they are. So I have these things all categorized and I keep shifting the categories. I have women over here and then I have sitting people over here and then I have things Chinese over here and then I have things coming in from the left over here and it's getting all scrambled. And I go into the kitchen and I'm cooking dinner and I picture a photograph in my mind the same way that I can see many other photographs in my mind. Like I can see President Kennedy shot in the convertible in my mind. Was I there? No, but it's a photograph I've seen many times and I can picture it perfectly. So I see this photograph in my mind and I go back into the studio to check on a little detail of the photograph only to discover that the photograph I so clearly see in my mind's eye is in fact a braid of four photographs. It's the woman from this one, with the man from this one, with the dog from this one, and the parking lot from this one. And I thought, oh, this is the same phenomena as when four different people witnessed the same traffic accident and they each think they thought it, saw it clearly and have a completely truthful report and in fact they've all misremembered it. I want to do this. So I thought, I want to do something that walks through the door of verisimilitude that small black and white photo photography walks through and yet is fictional and made from my imagination. This is another scrapbook and you can see the same kind of thing where, yes, it's a Van Gogh, but it's a jigsaw puzzle Van Gogh. Yes, it's a T.S. Eliot poem, but it's also a necklace. And here's another one of my early uh, collected photos. So I set out trying to figure out how am I going to make this kind of fictional photography and I basically just, 
I remembered, this was the biggest light bulb of all, I remembered going to a party with a bunch of people I'd gone to grad school in Madison with, and I struck up a conversation with this woman, and I said, what are you doing? And she said, well, my day job is I'm a photo retoucher, and I'm working for Vogue right now, and I've been doing it for 20 years. So I called her up, and I said, I want to do something that's like a collage made from found elements inside found photographs, and I want to put them together in Photoshop but I somehow want it to be a photograph. Is that possible? You know, I'm, I mean, I talked to a bunch of people. By the time I got to her, it was a little more sophisticated than that. But basically, she said, yeah, I know how to do that, and I can introduce you to a bunch of people, and we can all figure this out together. So this is a photograph. It's relatively recent. It's about 900 times bigger on this screen than it is in the gallery in Detroit, where you'll see it or where you may see it, and it's called Dig. And it consists of, I don't know, maybe 10 photographs that I found. Now, I have to say, when you do this, this work from collecting like I do, you have to collect like a maniac because most found photographs are completely banal. You have to look at a 1,000 before you're even vaguely interested in one. So I go to the flea market every Saturday morning, and I've now met all these other collectors at the flea market. I swap and share with them. I have these pickers now, and I invite the other collectors. When the pickers come into town, I go, I have pickers now in Germany. When we went to France and Germany two consecutive years in a row, I came back with so many photographs in my backpack that I set off the metal detector in the airport. And the guy said to me, what is it in your backpack? And I said, snapshots. And he said, snapshots doesn't set off the machine. And I said, I had this happen in Germany two years ago. There's a little silver in every one. And he was like, take the backpack off. And I, you know, like he, an hour later, he was like, you're right. <laughs> so anyhow, um, what happens to me some of the time, you probably know this famous expression that Jasper John said, where he said, sometimes I see it, and then I paint it. Sometimes I paint it, and then I see it. Sometimes I have an idea in my mind about a photo I want to make, and I go to the universe and look for the components. And sometimes, in the act of looking in the universe, I find something, and I like that something. And then two years later, I find something else, and when I see the guy assembling the whale skeleton in his backyard, I think, wow, I like this with that building in Damascus, you know? And I kind of trust that in my mind, the one thing is linked to the other thing. I'm not going, hmm, where would this look good and look through thousands of things. My mind is kind of making that connection. Now, then I'm seating it in a couple of places, and I have these people, and we can move on to another photo. But one of the interesting things about it is nine times out of 10, it works the same way for me that all painting works, which is I finish the thing and I realize some very intrinsic thing that it has to do with my life. Like when I was a little kid, you know, my aunt, my, I lived with my grandmother and she spent her childhood in Egypt and my aunt was floating in and out of the house and she was working on a dig in Luxor. So this whole idea of archeology span in the Middle East actually has a sort of personal component to me. I want to point out that another thing I'm really interested in with photography is I'm not only collecting and combining and working with the images you see in the photograph, but implied in the photograph, unlike painting, are the other photographers. These people, particularly at either side in the front, are looking out very clearly at someone. And that someone is not me. It's another person between me and them. And sometimes I say that I'm kind of collaborating with all these other photographers. They just don't know that they're collaborating with me. Uh, this is a photograph that came out of a collection I made of kids in pedal cars, both in Europe, in America, and in Japan. And I didn't know what I was going to do with it for quite a while until I found a couple of these gas stations. And then the whole idea, the Shell station I thought was beautiful. So the whole idea kind of came together in my mind. 
And I, I thought that a pretty important part of it was these bystanders up there. The idea of, it's a sort of like a complicated diagram, like a bank shot in a pool game or something where I'm looking at them, they're looking at me, there's the, all the implied photographers, then they're looking at them, then I'm looking at them, and they're looking at me. That is something I really find interesting and provocative. This is probably the first photograph where after I assembled lots of found things, and there's a process of erasure that happens too, like this man back here is this very dejected looking soul and he's sitting on a truck. For reasons I will never know, he had the end painted on his bald head, which I thought was kind of stupid, so I erased that. So, you know, there's a lot of things that come out or for example, different windows were broken than were actually broken. I liked one composition better than another. But it's this picture where I ran out of pavement and I thought, I was looking and looking and looking. I thought, this is ridiculous. I live in a city of pavement. Why am I trying to find a found photograph of pavement? I'll just start taking pictures. So as time went on, I. I you know, would do things like entice my five-year-old niece to a domino game because I was working on this photograph with the linoleum and the coverlets and the polka dot pattern and I thought dominoes in the foreground would be quite lovely and would also imply that perhaps they had played a domino game before or after dinner. Speaking of before or after, one of the things that is also intriguing to me is this idea of how a space for example, we opened up this room. What do I mean when I say that? I, say, I mean that in the original photograph, you couldn't see what was going on in that room. But through a process of enhancement, I know that sounds like kind of a CIA term, but through a process of enhancement, we can open up that room so you can see in there and you can think of that room as a possible before or after the dinner scene. We even moved this uh, electrical cord because it was too close to his head the way the picture naturally fell together. This is a photograph called The Time Game which started out in my mind with a kind of marriage of a photograph taken in Martinique of a, of a woman that had her two children, not, not this boy but two other kids, balanced on a turtle. And then some time later I found these traffic lights and I had this idea of time and turtles and traffic, and I do feel like photography traffics in time in a different way than painting does. So I conceived of this game as a kind of freeze tag where people are all in a state of motion. There's some circularity to the motion. This guy running away became quite important to me, and she's it, and she's the timekeeper, and she's the time freezer. And after I finished the photograph, it occurred to me that the whole thing was a kind of metaphor for photography itself, that she is the one that snaps the moment and freezes it. This is Spree, which is a little bit of a pun because I bought her photograph in Germany, so it's both the river in Berlin and a word that we have for, I don't know, a binge, a letting go, whatever. And I was thinking of her as a kind of mistress of a fairy tale, almost like a cross between the protagonist and the director. And this is a duck house I had been longing to use for a long time. I call it the Taj Mahal of duck houses. And I thought of these swans as sort of being her charges. And at one point I thought that she should feed them too. So I went out and got a bowl and took its picture Photography loves stainless steel and put it in there so she could be feeding them. So it's kind of like making a movie. You're kind of like a director and you think about what's going to be there. You know, this is in terms of reaction. I saw, I have a bunch of old timey marriage photos. I guess I'm kind of attracted to the strings of tin cans. And I saw Arlene and Dick in a flea market and I pulled them out of the box and I thought, Dick, you're gonna become Sue. <laughs> and that was really quite a bit before gay marriage came as topical as it has been lately. 
And I knew I owned this motel, which was called Last Frontier. So that kind of concept just all came together in my mind. Of course, in the end, I made my own strings of cans because the original strings of cans weren't really that great. And then I found these two dogs, and I had this notion in my mind that one woman was registering and the other woman was taking the picture, and each of their dogs were focused differently on them. Um, this is a photo called bottle tree. Do you know what bottle trees are? It's an African-American practice where the bottle is put upside down on the branch of the tree with the intention of trapping spirits with its glintiness and the spirit can't get back out almost like a fish trap. So the idea here is that this old woman is sleeping and she puts out these dolls and it attracts the little girl. The little girl they never had, the little girl they had and lost. It's probably a photograph about losing a child. But if they sleep and go into another state, she'll come and visit them. So that's kind of. Um, I think of this as a father and son. I mean, sometimes I'm not quite this biographical. But in general, I have to kind of get into the people. And I have to feel like, where they're going to live. And this is something really interesting to me about photography. I feel like if I paint a room with a curtain in it, and you look closely at the curtain, you're thinking, ah, this is the way Jane Hammond paints a curtain. But if I have a photograph with a curtain in it, and the photograph has sufficient resolution, which I always strive for, that you can really come up close to it and see it, then you think, ah, my sister had curtains like this in her bedroom. Or you think, ah, chenille bedspread. I know what that feels like. So there's this kind of shared social quality that happens in the things in photographs about the way the underpants drape, or the way the plywood looks, or the way the undershirt sags. And it's familiar to all of us, and I think I don't know, I think that's very sort of interesting. I like that. This woman, it occurs to me, is a little bit a cousin of the woman in Spree. She's a duck herd and she's tending her flock and her flock is concentrated in this pond that is so small, it's like a cross between a pocket mirror and a pond. It couldn't be any smaller than it is. And when I was working on this, I was really thinking of it very much as a kind of black and white essay. It wasn't as psychological for me as some other things are. And I was just thinking of, of it as a kind of color essay. And there are some kind of interesting, almost forensic-like things that happen when I do this, like the idea of marrying the wind direction of her peacock feathers with the wind direction of the smoke or I actually have a new studio assistant and she has a boyfriend whose parents live in Connecticut. So I said, Phoebe, can you get me like a duck stick? She was like, well, what, what characteristics does a duck stick have? Like, it should be five or six feet long and have a little curve to it and be the kind of thing that she could like whip at the ducks. So she did faithfully come in on the train with the duck stick. So to make these photographs that I've now been making since 2004, as I say, you have to collect many, you have to look at jillions of things to collect the things you want to have. Then of course you never exactly know what you want to have because you don't know what you're going to find down the road and you don't know how you're going to change and you, don't, you might think you don't want a photograph of Elvis Presley, but then you would think, oh my God, I wish I had that photograph of Elvis Presley. So you have to kind of buy everything. So now I own, 15,000 of other people's photographs, and I have them categorized in all kinds of ways, and it's made me fall in love with snapshots. It also made me fall somewhat out of love with this identical way that I was working before, and it made me want to make some kind of painting that was glassier, flowier, and had more of an overt time element. I had, for the first time in my life, no idea what this kind of painting was going to look like. Many times I've made paintings that I saw completely in my head and just basically painted the painting I saw in my head. 
And the only image I had was the image you have when you're standing in the back of an outboard motorboat and the motor is on and it's churning up the water and you see this little hill of water right outside the boat and it's glassy and smooth on the outside and it's all churned up underneath. And I thought, I want a painting that's like that. But of course, like I didn't want a painting of that. I just wanted a painting like that operationally. Anyhow, I'm a big believer that artists should do their own shopping because you discover materials in the store that you didn't know you wanted until you see them. And I went to the store to look for paper for a drawing. I have these drawings in this show and they're made of like 55 different kinds of white paper. I mean, I have the biggest collection of white paper you've ever seen from like myriad countries, et cetera, et cetera. So I was buying all this white paper and I saw a drawer and the drawer said mica on it. Now, I know what mica is because I played in a mica mine in Connecticut as a child. So I said, mica, let me see that. Open that drawer, what's in there? And the woman picks up a sheet of mica. It's a composite of mica minerals, like particle board as many wood chips amalgamated together. This is that of mica. And she holds it up and between me and her is a window and the light is coming through it and it's coming through it fully in some places and it's semi-opaque in other places and it's got this kind of champagne -y color. It's very variable on the spectrum between translucency and transparency and I think it's utterly beautiful. So I'm like, I'll take that. How many do you have? And the crazy thing was three weeks later, they didn't have it anymore. But in the meanwhile, you know, because this is the age that it is, we found this Russian guy that sells mica on 34th Street who used to be in jail in Siberia and you have to bring cash and you know, it's $500 minimum. And you know, I'm like dragging my boyfriend with her. I can't, you, I can't go there alone, don't make me go there alone. So I buy up this huge quantity of mica and I play with the idea of a photo-based photograph, a photo-based painting on a surface of mica that's variably transparent and has some kind of light coming from behind it. This is totally, one of the things I really like reading about is the history of science and early science where people had their own curiosity, their own sensory apparatus, and their own idea about what an experiment would be and they held up prisms and they observed Jupiter and they basically learned things through trial and error. And I had this sense, I didn't want to make something that you plugged in. I didn't want to make something that I sent to someone else and they made it for me. I wanted to use my own kind of like wits and eyes and make something that gleamed back at me in a way that I felt inhabited the image. Sometimes the image is a, what I call a press photo. It's a professionally taken photo or a small p professionally taken photo. And in this case, this was sort of an interesting image for me because the people were entertainers and they were on a stage, so clearly there was a sense of light in the picture, much more than, say, in the picture I showed you before. So I came to think about the marriage between the image and the light as subjects and to experiment with how the light kind of enlivened the image. I mean, the snapshot is a frozen moment. It's just a millisecond, as you know. And it occurs in a stream, in a necklace of moments of, of wind and sun and the before and the after and what you're saying at the moment and how the snake is moving, et cetera, and boom, there's just this one moment that the, this picture is. And I feel like when the dazzle paintings are working, as I would like to think I've gotten them to work, that you walk before them and it's, an, it, it's paramountly important to walk back and forth, to move in front of them, not to be still. And you'll see the woman's skirt and the guy's elbow when you're over here. And then as you move across it, you'll see her cheekbone and you'll see the second snake. You know, you'll have, 
a changing experience as you view the painting, which I feel returns to the snapshot some of the river of time that it was a part of when it was first plucked out. I, I'm particularly fond of this painting because I feel like it has these sort of realities inside realities. She is posing for a group of her army cohorts who are taking pictures. So we're looking at a picture of someone having their picture taken. And in turn, they've been snagged for this event by a group of snake charmers who just happen to be out looking for the picture takers. So you've got these kind of myriad levels of reality. This painting lives here in town and is for me an interesting duo or trio, depending on your point of view, of, of people who are present and absent. So you have this partial woman, this partial man, his more explicit shadow, in a sense, than body, these other shoes that might be the photographer's, they might be the woman's, and then these kind of diagonals of, it's a kind of equation about what's there and what isn't there. This is a little painting that I made. I thought it was very clever of me because I was having a show in Paris and I thought Ritz, you know, to them it's kind of a high thing and to us it's more of a low thing. And I made it with a lot of color and very transparent mica and it's the first painting where I put this golden color of the crackers and I think it's pretty close to that color that the crackers really are behind and deep in the painting. So the surface of the crackers is clear, but the gold is way inhabiting the back of the painting. Trampoline is a painting that to me has this kind of transcendent quality, which is kind of crazy. How can you have transcendence in a suburban shopping mall? But it reminds me when I see it of this Henri Cartier-Bresson photograph where a little boy has thrown a ball up into the air and he's like this waiting to catch it and Bresson has cropped the photograph so you no longer see the ball and the boy is just like all upward expectancy and I kind of feel that when I when I see the guy up in the air. Now this is a found photograph and it's a press photograph but what I did was change the height of the man. I changed the proportional relationships of the man, the signpost, and the flags to be, I don't know, I guess what I would say, better. Um, there is this thing in American vernacular photography that I call horsing around. It's a little bit like reality TV. It's not scripted, but it's not what the people would be doing if the camera weren't there in the room with them. So. There's this thing in America where you'll see a photograph of five women and all of them have a paper bag on their head. After looking at photographs for hundreds of hours in both France and Germany, I can tell you I have seen no photographs where four French women have paper bags over their heads. It's just like, it turns out it's an American trait more than it's a vernacular trait. And this is one of the best ones I've ever laid eyes on as a found photograph although the actual photograph I based it on is overexposed, gray, it's a very unprepossessing looking photo. When I looked at it, I thought, wow, these are two guys lynching each other for fun. You know, you really don't see this every day. <laughs> and these two girls who are here in Detroit are in my mind sort of cousins. It's maybe not quite as edgy but there are two people that are engaged in a kind of affectionate play for the, perp for the entertainment of the third person who's taking their picture. They're actually sisters and acrobats. You get a sense of that when you see their shoes. And the woman that's being held is smoking. I can, if someone wants to ask a question, I can explain how I do the color in these. But I, I made particular so many people in these 50s photographs are smoking and there's something about it that I know it's bad for you but it's kind of cool in the photos. This is made from a fictional found photograph that is to say I collaged together uh, three different couples to make 
my idea of who should be with who, but they're standing in the way that the original couple was standing, which is back on the end of that diving board, and that was my real attraction to them. I just like compositionally love this kind of setup and this kind of parity between them and the board. Um, this is a painting called Floater. My favorite part of it is the top third where this very ratty kind of background with these tin roofed huts and the chain link fence kind of dissolves into this abstract pattern. And this guy behind the pool is wearing a gold shirt that's made the same way the Ritz cracker box is made. A little embellished, a little, I've advanced it a little bit, but I got the idea doing the Ritz cracker box. And I like the way that when I walk back and forth in front of the painting, I feel like me and him were both watching this guy. You know, we, we're making a kind of human ambulatory sandwich in that moment in time. And this is my most recent painting. It's not as big as it is on this screen, but I think it's the largest painting here in the show in Detroit. And in some ways, I think it's the most mysterious and complex of all the paintings. In fact, I would say in all ways, it's the most mysterious and complex. A lot of times, you'll find what's called a press release photo, and on the back is the press release. So it's very didactic, and it's very clear what it is. This was a press release photo whose press release got lost. So I can't tell you much more about it than you could if you'd looked at it for a thousand hours. Um, in my mind, he's the centerpiece of the equation, and in my mind, the duck is a kind of, it's a kind of maternity. It's a kind of Mary and Jesus picture, if you will. And then surrounded by these other four people, there's actually another person there, there, and there, but it takes ages of looking to find them. And the, some of the people seem to be looking at the photographer, and some of the people seem to be looking at something that's over there. And there's that tension of what is going on most saliently and who is worrying about what is an interesting part of it to me. And then there's lots of coloristic and material things that are on the surface, in the surface, and behind the surface, which reminds me of a point I wanted to make, which is that I think to a great degree, these paintings come out of looking at screens. And I know so many people think, oh, looking at screens, it's so bad for you, it's so lowbrow. But I've been looking at the screen for hundreds of hours making the black and white photographs, looking for the black and white photographs online, you know, following some German dealer who's got a thousand photographs up today and the best ones will be picked off by tomorrow morning, so I gotta get right on it. And I'm interested in the way the image is sort of on the screen, in the screen, and behind the screen. And I'm very interested in the way when I move from side to side, the image actually changes semiotically. The person looks older, they look madder, they look nicer. I mean, it changes in ways that are hard to put to words, but it does change. And so I think this experience of moving back and forth and this experience of the, the things, you'll have to see the show, but there's, there's metal leaf and other things on the surface of the painting, Behind, immediately behind the plexi of the painting and three inches back in the painting. So the color can be in all these different places and your eye puts it together differently depending on your distance from the object. And I think that comes out of screens. Um, and I find it beguiling myself. And lastly, Beverly, your professor, made a very interesting remark to me at the opening. She reminded me of how, like 25 years ago, she spent the night on my couch in Soho. And she said, don't you remember at the time you were making these all white paintings with objects embedded in the surface? And I was making paintings that had mango pits, harmonicas, shoes, fly swatters, all these things layered in wax in the surface. 
And so she was making an analogy between those paintings and these drawings, which are compilations of miscellany, originally emanating from a small collection I have of 50s novel novelty catalogs, which I like because they have lots of thingy things in them, but you don't necessarily know what things they are. They're kind of unnameable oddities. And um, they're all made on white paper and they're all silver or gold leafed behind. And where the white paper is transparent, you only see the metal, but you're actually seeing it through paper. And where it's not, you don't see the metal. So when you get up close to it, you'll see all these various kinds of white paper I talked about. Um, and they're not this big either. So I think I'll stop here. And then if you have questions, I'm always extremely happy to answer questions. Um, I've grown leery of making big summational remarks at the end about who I am and where I'm going. 